Bom, boa tarde. Nós então estamos começando hoje a série de seminários do segundo semestre desse ano. I will switch to English and for, for the beginning, for a good beginning, our invited today is Professor Gustavo Brussual. Uh, I invite Paula to talk about. <laughs> Oi, boa tarde a todo mundo. Uh, so Roberto asked me to introduce Gustavo, and that's very awkward because in, uh, in our field uh, his name uh, speaks for itself. Uh, <laughs> uh, he is, uh, no kidding, one of the most important researchers of uh, stellar population modeling and uh, spectral, thank you, spectral. Um, evolution of galaxies uh, with an uh, impressive legacy, more than 15,000 uh, citations and more than a few seminal papers that are now landmark in the field. Uh, he started his academic career with a PhD at Berkeley and uh, now, just beginning in the current position, he is now in UNAM, in Mexico, in the city of Morelia. Um, I'm very happy and honored that Gustavo <coughs> enjoys working with uh, Brazilian researchers. He has been here in Brazil for I don't know how many times. Do you remember Gustavo? We were counting. No, like ten. At least ten. So at least ten times he has been to Brazil, and uh, he, he has been here for the whole July. Um, and uh, I hope that I will manage to get funding to bring him at least once a year here to our department. Um, as a quick invitation, uh, after the, the talk, around the half plus three, we will have in the room before the um, secret, uh, Secretaria, we will have an informal group meeting with mm -hmm. Gustavo, so feel free to pass by, to come by, if you want to discuss his talk, uh, gather other ideas, and some of the students will present a little bit of their work. So we will have an informal, dis inf informal discussion on uh, star populations. So feel welcome if you want to join. Uh, Gustavo, thank you yeah. for coming. Thank you, Paula. And thank you, everyone, for being here. It's a pleasure for me to be again here in this prestigious campus. I don't want to bother you again or get you for eh, with the same kind of uh, talk. I will try to make it sort of new with some advances. But first of all, I will have like a 20 minute introduction to the subject for people who I think may be new to it. I want to get some uh, general background. First of all, I have to define what this is a stellar population synthesis. What's the, what's the motivation for this? First of all, I will go in 10 minutes explaining why it's a stellar population synthesis. How does it work? How do we use it? And then at the end, I will talk about some recent work and the applications that we have been the, working in the recent past. All of you have seen this kind of picture of the universe that has been provided by the Hubble Space Telescope. Some of you may uh, wonder what a uh, uh, noise, noise. We will make it brighter here. <laughs> I guess if you turn this off, uh, then you don't, see, you don't see me without this light. Hmm? You, you need this light? No? We, I don't think we need actually. Because I guess it will burn. Can you la can you dim the light? Paula, can I dim this light? Uh, either we turn it off or yes, I think it's better. No? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, better. You see many, many, many galaxies here. Almost everything here except these few stars are, are galaxies. And the extragalactic people or the cosmologists, they wonder what what this. How old are these galaxies? How big? Where they are? What distance? In what stage of evolution, etc. 
<laughs> so just to interpret any part of the universe and we, that we want to study, we need some tools. Yeah. It's not just uh, I immediately the thing that you notice immediately is that there are different sizes and different colors. The different sizes may be because there are different distances and if they were equally big, but they are intrinsic difference in size. And the difference in color, as we will see, is due to the fact that they have different ages and they are dominated by different kinds of stars. So just to, this, to study this, we need some astrophysical tools that will tell us how the stars change with time and how the properties of galaxies, which are a big number of stars, are changing with time. And that's exactly the, the purpose of a stellar population synthesis. It's just a tool to interpret the visible units. Without this tool, it would be a lot more difficult to understand this. If we didn't have any knowledge of stellar astrophysics, even if we have these pretty pictures, we, we wouldn't know what's happening. So how does a stellar population synthesis work? This is something like the algebra of stellar population synthesis. You have a set of stellar evolutionary tracks, so I will explain later on, but most of you know what it is. You have a magic function that we call the initial mass function that tells you how many stars are born every time there is an event, event of star formation. The, the stars of different masses are born according to a different, a different function. It, it doesn't matter if we know it very well or not. You can always come out with a recipe. So you have tracks that tell you how the stars age, number of stars. You have a stellar atlas, which can be observed based on local stars, or you can have a theoretical atlas or a spectra. And then you will come out with a, something that will look like this. This is a stellar spectrum, a, a galaxy spectrum, that will change in time as the stellar population ends. Every time I, I, I know, Yes. So the stellar evolutionary tracks are a, a set of calculations that people do. Now it's almost in an industrial fashion that they get the, how, how the stars evolve in the initial diagram for very large number of stars with many masses, many metallicities. And I have indicated here in the, it's a very old set of tracks, but it still is very pedagogic, pedagogical because you have here the main sequence in green so giant branch in cyan, the red giant branch in red, horizontal branch in blue, and working in burning, the AGV in yellow, and the rest of the evolution is mostly the white dwarf in magenta. And essentially, when you have stars that are born all together at the same time with a single metallicity, all the astrophysics of their life is in this diagram, right? You know how the evolution of the luminosity and temperature will go with time. So the objective of a stellar population synthesis is to put together what we know about the evolution of the stars in this diagram with the spectra that the star will have in every point in this diagram to put together a model for the spectra of the stellar population. So it's very simple. This is just adding numbers. This is the most uh, recent uh, version of the same. Uh, I don't know where the. Where is the noise produced? It's not here. Yes. I, I think it's from the speaker. It doesn't matter. Well, I, I hear it on the sound system. Yeah. There is interaction. So this is the same kind of plot with a, a newer set of tracks so from more recent years. And you see here very complete uh, evolution. And I have added here, after the AGV, we have this that we call the thermal pulsing. AGV stars that I, I will mention at the end, 
which are very important because they are very bright and they are very cool, so they will emit a lot of light in the infrared. And yet they cannot be ignored in your model if you are interested in infrared emission. Then, what do you do with this? This is a mess, many points. You have to do something to work. So what you do is you, to pro you produce an isochron. What's an isochron? You, ask, you go to the table where these numbers are, and you read where the star of a given age are placed. And then you go into the, a di diagram, which is this is color <coughs> magnitude, it's all the same thing. And you put the locus of all the stars with the same age. That's what is an isochron for, by definition. Once you, you know the isochron, you will know where are the star of the star cluster which were born at the same position at the same instant of time, you will know that all the stars should be in an isochron by definition. Then it's easy. If you know the spectra of all the stars in this isochron, you can cook. You know the number of the stars due to the IMF, you put together the spectra. The IMF is not magic. I, I show here two examples of Peter and Chabrier. They are very similar below one solar mass. Uh, above one solar mass, below one solar mass, there are fewer stars in the Chabrier than the Sun Peter when you normalize them to the same total mass. As I, as I said, there is no magic on, on the IMF. Uh, we don't know where it is, so we still parameterize it as different IMF, but at the end, the models don't depend very much on this, unless you are interested in very specific properties. Then you come out with something like this, which is a spectrum, a spectral energy distribution, SED, when you read all the time, which tells you how the spectra of the stellar population is decreasing as a function of the age here in giga years. The 13 giga years is something old, one million years is something very young here. And you see that since the stars die, they disappear, the host star disappears, there is a almost a sixth order of magnitude decrease in the flux, the amount of energy emitted by the stellar population when they go from time zero <coughs> to recent. <coughs> so this is the whole thing. I mean, once you have this, you have the tool to interpret something like the Hubble Deep Field Diagram that I showed before. This is just for a simple stellar population. Mm -hmm. We call it simple because it's a single event of star formation. Mm -hmm. You could have a more complicated events in which the star formation is any function of time that you wish, and then you can use an integral like this to compute the properties of the composite population based on the properties of the simple population. In here, this is the same plot as before, simple stellar population, just yeah. going down in time, there is nothing here, everything cools and becomes this kind of spectrum. If we have a composite population like here, in which you have new events of a star formation, the properties will change. This is a particular case of a exponentially decaying star formation rate. And you see that the, the, the same color are for the same age. You see that the, the, it changes a lot. So it, it, it's important that when we study stellar population, we have an idea if we are looking at a simple population or a composite population, because we will make we will get the wrong conclusions if we use the, the wrong model, which is no surprise. So what are the most basic applications for, that people use for this? One uh, that I will explain to you is this, uh, the dating how all our galaxies, so mm -hmm. dating a stellar population just using the spectra, or also to discover distant galaxies. These mm have -hmm. become very fashionable in the mm -hmm. recent <coughs> past in the last decade or, or more decades or more. So this is a, an illustration for newer people in this field. This is an HR diagram for a very in time zero, for instance. You have this temperature luminosity and this color called, called by temperature. Very hot and very bright stars are here, very massive. Low mass and red are here. And this is a spectra that you get from one of these models. This will correspond to a very very young star for a, a cluster, something like this. Okay, I will go to a series of pictures in which I will see, I will show you how the the isochrons are changing in this diagram and how the spectra will change. I will keep the, the blue line here just switch you. for comparison. You can see how the evolution goes. So you see, at two million years already we have some 
So it starts disappearing from the zero H main sequence. And yeah, the, the spectra already changes. Yeah? It's the red line. We go 5 million years, mm -hmm. 10 million years, mm -hmm. 20, 50, 100, 200. This is nothing in astrophysical terms, but the spectra has changed a lot. 300, 400, 500 million, 1 giga year. We already see almost an old population in 1 giga year. There is nothing about this in sequence here. So it's saying already, it's all, it's all red because it's all uh, cool. I, 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 and there is much less evolution after that. It's five, five giga years, 10 giga years, 13 and a half, the age of the universe. Mm -hmm. So in, the, in this last, you see that the, the flux gets down, but the shape doesn't change. So it's very hard to distinguish age when you are dealing with all populations because all of them have more or less the same aspect. So this is what I can compute. This is what our models tell you, and this is what people are happy with because they have this tool. It's like a ruler to measure age. It's like a clock, more than a ruler. So when you reach here, you, you be, we begin with the NH2 region, and we end up with something like this. This is a spectra for a, a, a globular cluster. Right? We have all the stars are very old and have this kind of ice chart there. Now, this is a give we provide is the evolution in time of the stellar population and the corresponding spectrum. But when we observe this, it doesn't work this way. In, when you go to the Hubble deep field, we are here and we are looking to very distant galaxies at a given redshift, right? Uh, so so the, the nearby things where we are are all systems, and what we want to look in the, in the distant universe are very young. So we, we have to take that into account. And in reality, what happens is this. the age of the universe goes with redshift like this, right? We are here. Zero redshift is an old universe. And as we go to high redshift, the universe becomes very young. So if we have a galaxy of, Z of seven, which is very common now. Even up to 10 have, have their observations. We have seen galaxies that have, have been there for 98% of the age of the universe. Right? So the fact that there are global clusters in our galaxy, these clusters are traveling with us in this galaxy since the beginning of the universe, practically. They have almost the age of the universe. So we have to put everything together to be able to interpret the uh, redshift plus evolution, and try to determine a galaxy. So what happens? It, this picture that I was showing you has to be, we have to see, to think of this the other way around. When, when redshift increases, what happens is, is this. We are seeing younger and younger stellar populations, right? Until we reach there. This will happen to very high C. So when we see a galaxy, at the redshift of seven or ten, it has to be very young and has to have an spectrum like this. Right? Plot. Now, this is still the theory. In reality, it's more complicated because we have the cosmological redshift. It's not just that the time goes backwards or forward. It's just that the spectrum moves. Right? This is called redshift because it moves to the red. So in this model in which I, I was showing the evolution of the stellar population for different ages, when we go to the telescope and try to observe the spectra, the spectra have been shifted to the red because of the redshift, you know, the, the Doppler effect due to the expansion of the universe. So you see that the spectra, if you, if you concentrate in a given wavelength, the spectra are very different when you take into account the, cost, the expansion of the universe if you ignore it, look at the, the local spectrum, which is the red of 15 giga years, which you see as equal mm. zero, it's the same in most plots. Mm. But this, this is the redshift that we will see a spectra of these corresponding edges. And, and look at that the, the jungle spectra is out of the plot because the redshift is so high that we, we will never see it. Right? So that's, that's the whole problem here. That this will get fainter. You get dimmer because the star evolved, 
And they also get dimmer because they go away from the detectors. Eh? They disappear from the detectors because there are no photons in that, uh, in some specific range. Unless you are observing here, in which everything is very bright. And this is the infrared. And that's why the new space telescope will work in infrared, because here everything is bright. If we put some filters here, it's the same thing, pedagogical uh, slide. Mm -hmm. We have these kind of filters. When we are at rest, every filter sees a lot of light. light. All, all these filters were defined for stars, so they get a lot of light. But when you take into account the redshift, you see that there are many filters, especially in the U band, in the bluer bands, that start seeing less and less light because their spectra are shifted. So these galaxies, even if they are young and they are massive and big, they will look faint because there is no light allowed for, for the cosmo by the cosmological expansion. The same here, this is more clear. So you have a, this is a, a galaxy, 13 giga zero, zero. We will see in these two filters. When there is no redshift, we see light in both fi filters. But as the spectra shift, here we don't see anything. We say, oh, in this, in this region of the universe, there is not, it's nothing, it's empty, but it's not true. It's full of galaxies that we cannot see. An example of this is a, this is a cluster of, a galaxy cluster of Abel 1689, in which here in this uh, square, there is nothing. Right? In the Hubble telescope, you don't see anything. But when, when you go to the infrared, you start seeing something, even with the Hubble. And if you work with a speaker, you see a very bright galaxy. Right? Mm -hmm. So this guy, why, why don't, why is not visible in, the, in here? Because of the cosmological structure. It's a galaxy formed approximately when the universe was 700 million years. <coughs> oh, that means 13 giga years ago, and we have seen the, a, a redshift of almost six. How, we do, how can we, where do these numbers come from? It's no magic. The, the magic of the space telescope is to give you the, the nice pictures. But you need something to put even order of magnitude here. It doesn't matter if it's 700 or 500 or 600 or 400 or whatever. It's very old, is what we need. And somebody, people who do galaxy formation models have to be able to explain how so early after the formation of the universe there were big galaxies which are still together. It's not, a, it's not trivial statements. But these numbers come from a stellar population synthesis because using the techniques that I uh, outlined before, you get to these kind of numbers. Mm. This is another plot of, these are candidates to be distant galaxies. How people know that? Because of these kind of plots. See in this filter, huh? you don't see anything here. It's no galaxy, no galaxy, no galaxy, but all of a sudden there is something here. It's the same field in different bands. Here, here. So th these are called, the English have very good words for everything. So these are J dropouts because they don't show in, in the J band. Okay? So if you do a, a statistical analysis and there are very good people for these things, you can find a probability of what's the most likely ratio for these things. That that do not show in the J, in the J band, which is an infrared band, and just you get this, the likelihood peaks around 10. So these galaxies are more likely very, very far, because they can, you don't see anything, because there's no light in the bluer bands. And then when you, when you, you have to prove this, and it's not only statistics and many things, you do some observations, it's with the speaks and Hubble, and, there are upper limits and so, but they match pretty well what you expect from this kind of population, a very high redshift, and you are looking at, at, the, at the limit and the ultraviolet of the galaxy as G of A, there is no more light, that's what you, you don't detect anything. So this is all consistent, and this is already many years old, and there are many, many samples of galaxies like this that have been discovered now, and it's by this, 
you, have, you discover the galaxy because you don't see them. It's a, it's a negative uh, result. I mean, it's a positive result based in a negative result. <laughs> so you have to look for places where there is nothing in the, in the blue and something in the red and infrared. OK, so this was an introduction for a motivation for people who have never heard of it. Now we want to improve the things. I mean, we have to keep working and we, we are paid to, to do things, so we have to, to improve things. Why? Well, this, this kind of model has been successful and have provided good results. And in general, they will continue providing good results for a long time because the observations are still not good enough. Right now, the detectors are improving a lot. People are getting a spectra of very good resolution and will be getting a spectra of very high resolution, much better than the ones we have in the models. So somehow we have to keep up with the observation. It's embarrassing with the observation to be better than the theory in terms of resolution, signal to noise, etc. Et <laughs> so one problem that I didn't mention, I will mention now, is that to compute the things, you need huge numbers of spectra of the stars. And even if you don't believe it, there are very few stars in the sky for which we know the spectra from the UV to the infrared with good signal to noise that we know the parameter of the stars. Maybe there are 1,000 of those stars, and you're lucky. And most of those are of the, pro the, the metallicity similar to the solar neighborhood. So I didn't mention it. As the galaxies, it's another problem. As the galaxies are very far away, they haven't had time to produce the chemical elements. So most likely, they have a, a, stellar, a metallicity content, a metal content that is different from the solar neighborhood. So we have, in principle, we have to add the chemical evolution to all of these models. So we have to keep adding better libraries of stellar tracks, better library of stellar spectra. We have to implement some kind of analytics tools so people can do this automatically, right? Nobody wants to sit down in the computer to fight uh, for one week just to fit the spectra of a single galaxy, which mm. is what that happens usually. Yeah. But, but then after you do it for two, three, four galaxies, there is a way I won't Want, I don't want to keep doing this forever. So you need automatic tools in which you put one million galaxies and then you get the, the statistical adjustment or fits to the observation like this kind of code bigger and there are many more. I am, I am advertising this because there is a friend of mine. <laughs> ah, you know him, you, he was here, Yeah, Jacob. yeah, Jacob was here, six months. So the, the idea is you are giving a spectrum and to tell as much as possible about the properties of the stars, of the gas, of the dust, of the everything in that galaxy. So for that reason, we need models which are better than the ones that we were having using <coughs> until a few years ago. You will be surprised that these, uh, these models by myself and Charlotte that have been so successful, we only have 100 stellar spectra in those in those models. So with 100 stellar spectra, we, we dare to talk about different <laughs> metallicity models, different everything, and they seem to work. But we want to check to see if we can improve. It's, it's not easy. So now we are using these evolutionary tracks, which are called Parsec, Parsec yeah. which is a, a joint venture between Padova and Trieste. Okay. One of the Padova people but they were guys in the two years and they keep working together. <laughs> so they have a, a very good set of tracks. And also they include the TPAGV stars from Maribu, which is in power. So at the moment we are implementing 16 metallicities. There are only 15 here. And there is one more higher on this. In which the tracks, which is the the metal contains is the first number and the helium contains the second number. So everything in blue is below solar. This is sort of solar, even though some people say solar is controversial. Yeah. This is above solar. 
So, but for a single uh, metallicity, we have 26,000 points in the child area. So in the ideal case, we will need 26,000 inspectors to produce a model of a single metallicity, which is reliable. If you, when, when Paula finishes her wonderful machine of computing a stellar spectra, she may be able to compute 26,000 spectra for different gravities, metallicity, states, temperature, etc. that will be perfect. But right now, we, for every, any, every a given metallicity, even if we use theoretical spectra, we don't have more than a few hundred. In empirical, at most, we will have 200 for a given metallicity. But still, you can do something. There are many stellar libraries. In the, even in the Utah Valley, that we have many more than we used to have before. These are theoretical models, or the Pilasti models. Mm -hmm. These are also theoretical models. Martins. These are all theoretical, the, 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 the ones here in the UV. I will be talking a little bit about the world project stars that are very important for young stellar populations in which you have the massive stars, very young populations. So we need some spectra, and these are, fortunately, these people in Postdoc have computed the library of spectra for world project stars, which some people like. Um, there are something they call world project galaxies, so which are stellar populations dominated by world project stars. In the visible, which is what we should know more, it's embarrassingly poor, the situation. We have the Miller's library, which have 1,000. Miller's means 1,000 in Spanish, more likely in Portuguese as well. But for them, Miller's means something else. But they have not even 1,000. It's 980 stars. The Indo-US is, is a parallel library, which also is at most 1,000 stars. The Hubble library, which is a few hundred. And the Stelic, which is the one we use before, is only 100. So this is what we count from the empirical point of view to compute uh, this kind of models. Also, I should have that here, the Paula models. She has been working hard to, to compute models that can be used for a stellar population. And my visit here now is to compare her models with the Miller's models using exactly the same parameters that people claim that the observed star have. We are comparing it what the theory tells you that the spectrum should look like it, it really is. And we have found many, at least 40, 40 stars that have wrong parameters just comparing the theoretical spectra with the observed spectrum. So it's a good tool for this. And we are making an analysis of how reliable it is to use a theoretical spectra as compared to empirical spectra. This is sort of a religious thing. There are people who think <laughs> that population synthesis should only use empirical data. Other people think other way around. I think a mix of them. I'm not faithful to any other <laughs> religion. I try to use whatever is available. And uh, one thing is that the theory is getting better and better. And I think after Paula and I finish this work, we will conclude that for most things, it's equivalent to use the theoretical spectra as the empirical spectra, at least when you compare two digits. And in the near infrared, which is very important, we also have uh, some problems. There are very few spectra, spectral libraries which are complete. The IRTF is a, just a few hundred stars. This, there are this model for carbon stars by Allinger. The, the Basel library, which is based in Kuluk's model, is very old now, but still very useful. Just to get a rough idea of how things should look like. It's a very low resolution, but the shapes and maybe okay. And also, when you want to deal with this kind of stars, which are thermally pulsing and GV stars, which are in the phase in which they have ex exploded or have ex um, thrown out the shell of dust, you have to take into account the dust emission. And there are some codes that do this for you, so you have to implement. But in principle, we have all these things, and we want to, to put it together. As I mentioned, I will pay some attention to the war register. So there, this is a new complication. There are many kinds of war register, carbon, NE, NL, O. 
they are more, more important for this kind of metallicities and that's why they computed these models only for these metallicities. These spectral models cover this uh, uh, wavelength range with this uh, resolution. And what happens when you put this together? Okay. I will show some examples, maybe some crazy examples, but this is a, a stellar population close to solar, a little bit below solar, and half a million years. 500,000 years, less than 1 million years. Right. And if this is it, if you form a star of the upper mass limit is 600 solar mass or 100 solar mass, and at this very early age, everything is main sequence. That was magenta. Here the different phases are different. So I will show some of these to see when the world range stars are more important than the, the main sequence. That's a flash in the life of the galaxy. You either see it or you will never see it again. This is one million year, still made only main sequence. At two million years, you start seeing this sort of noisy thing here, down here. This is a, this kind of water star that is appearing here. And you see here in, in the very high mass, in a normal population with 100 solar masses, you will see. Here, you start seeing this noise. If you go to three million years, this is only one million year more. All these things that is above the magenta line is produce, produced by very few world fires stars. They are very hot and very bright. That's what they look so important in the very, look at the wavelength. This is a five million, three million years. And four million years, they are still there, <coughs> almost in the same fraction, in the same amount in both populations. But at five million years, they start decreasing. And at six million years, they are gone. So you either see, if you see world race stars, you, you have a perfect clock telling you that the stellar population has around four to five million years. But it's your only chance to see them. And you have to see them mostly in the UV. The, here, you, they will be mistaken with the main mm -hmm. series. There are some emission lines that are produced by World Fire There is people who are especially specialized on this. Now, this I show is for simple stellar population. If we go to a constant stellar population, just a place where you have a, a stars form and form and form all the time, this will change a lot. This, I will show the same ages. You see here, two million years. What's the problem here? That the, the main sequence is re, being reborn again. So you have more and more emission from the main sequence. So the effect of the water layer is less. So you will see a less significant water layer contribution when you have constant star formation. And it's harder to, to detect. You will have to make a very good study of the emission to be able to tell what is the presence of the emission. And why do we care about this? Well, if you look at the, the ionizing spectrum, it's very different. The one that we have in our previous models, or the, the models which ignore the world radio stars, will be like the magenta. This is the, high, the H1 ionizing edge. So you will have this number of ionizing points. So we are ignoring all of this if we don't include the world radio. And they, this becomes important if you are ionizing the gas in the galaxy during the age in which the, the world radio stars are important. So that the, this was the, the motivation for this, is that people kept complaining that we didn't have enough photos to ionize the medium because we didn't have <coughs> the world radio star. So in the new tracks, we have the world radio, and in the new spectra, we have the world radio spectra, because it's not the same that if you use the, like the Kulux models or the plastic <coughs> models, for the world radio stars, you will never get more than the magenta line. So you need a specific models for world radio stars in which they have been taken into account all the dynamics that goes around this star. This is the same for a constant star formation, and you see that the relevance of the world radio is less. And 
this is what people are happy with is that you tell them how many ionizing photons are there in this stellar population as a function of age. And this includes the contribution of the work register. I will show later on why this is important. A few words about the thermal impulsing AGB. As I mentioned before, this is a typical HR diagram of a stellar population of the LMC metallicity, where you have here <coughs> all these uh, things that we call PPAGB. So this is a classical tip of the AGB, the tip of the ray giant branch, the star, normal stars that we call, we, that one that people study in astrophysical courses, stop here. Right? So after the AGB finish, we, we go to the, it's a, a, they call it a double shell burning just before the planetary nebula phase. We have a, a short, these are short lived phases. One is reaching oxygen. These are real observations, the white points here. <coughs> these are observations of the LNC <coughs> uh, TPAGB star. The all rich ones follow there. The carbon rich ones are these red ones. And something I call super wind phase are I mean, again. So all these kind of stars are present in real galaxies and they will contribute the lot, as I was saying, in the infrared because they are very cool, very big, very bright. So your model is going to be wrong if we ignore these kind of stuff. So we, we have made many, many, many tests for doing this. And what I show here is just a result of what we have now introduced into population synthesis models. The black lines are the, the luminosity function of these stars, like here, all TPAGB, all rich, carbon rich in the LNC, it's the black lines. And the different color histograms is what we are getting in the models from the different assumptions that we have here is number of stars as a function of magnitude, it's a standard luminosity function. And even if the ribbon is not perfect, it's much better than it has ever been in this kind of models. So we are very happy with this. The same here in the color distribution. See that we are doing not so bad. I mean, it's much better than it has ever been. I don't dare to show what we have implemented in the past model. Maybe a single line somewhere around here outside the observation. So I guess people who worry about the TPAGB and population synthesis should be considering that this is, to first order, is well understood. Hmm. Especially thanks to the SAGE observation of the LMC, in which they make a census of all the LMC, all TPAGB stars in the LMC, and then we, we can play with real numbers, huh? not just a science fiction. So I will, I will show one application of these models in which is this a thesis of um, what's her name? Julia Jacqui in France. <laughs> uh, she, she did some self-consistent modeling of the spectral energy distribution and the nebular emission lines of a star forming galaxies. So what she did is she took our population synthesis models and used the photoionization code cloudy to make a a very mm, comprehensive okay. atlas of models and predictions for all the properties that you can imagine of galaxies in the are start forming at the moment. Which we think is what people will be seeing with the big telescopes in the next 10 years, and they need some kind of models to explain it. We, we cannot expect that the models that will work for nearby galaxies up to C of two or three will work at Z of 10 or more. That is what people are going to be seeing in the recent future. So the first step is to, we have to refine the stellar emission models for the UV2, the near infrared that we did. And what Julia did is to use Cloudy, still using it to produce this atlas, it's never ending. <laughs> Every time we change, uh, we change a parameter, everything changes, and she gets crazy. It's <laughs> mad at us because it's like six more months of calculation. But that's the way it is. <laughs> so what, what, what's the real thing? We give her something that this black line, mm. it's a galaxy spectrum, mm. it's a like, from zero to infinite almost. 
and she put this in the magic cloudy machine, and she will get like this red line, which is a spectrum in which the UV is missing, and something has a lot of emission lines and some uh, continuous flux that comes out of this country. That's all it is, no magic. The magic is in cloudy. Nobody cares, they just use it. <laughs> Don't laugh, it's true, I mean. <laughs> and the new generation is more and more like this. So what, what is in this model? All this possible metallicity, she's using the same metallicity. The same metallicities that we have in the track are being considered for the, the metallicity of the gas in this galaxy. We have the ionization parameter by all these values. These things <coughs> called the dust to metal mass ratio is very like this. The gas density of hydrogen here, the abundance of the ratio of carbon to oxygen, and the upper uh, mass limit of the ion. So she did all of this uh, immense uh, volume of parameter space and compute a wonderful <coughs> set of uh, models which I will show a few plots here so you can get a feeling of what's uh, the state of the art of the thing. Maybe it's too much information for what people really need. So uh, here are all the metallicities color coded from low to high. And we have some observations. This is from Kenny, from Starbuck galaxies and nucleus. So there is a lot of observation. You see there is a relatively good agreement going from around this metallicity up. There are no observations, it's very low. The dust to metal mass ratio increases with the symbol size. Bigger the symbol, more dust to metal. And carbon to oxygen increases in along this line. So it's a lot of information. If you ever need this kind of thing, please take a look at this before going again into computing this. There are more, many plots of this in Julia's paper. This is just a few. These are observations again. So we, we see we can try to estimate parameters for this kind of galaxies, which are, these are from Brickman and collaborators. And they will fav favor that the IMF, the interstellar medium has a metallicity bigger than 0.04. Many things like this, again. I don't want to get you bored with this. But this is available. Another application which is uh, important was to put this together, the stellar population plus the gaseous emission, plus what's the effect on the light. If you have a disk galaxy that light is traveling through the disk, you want to have a model, like a 3D model, in which you can vary everything and try to predict the spectra of the galaxy. So this is uh, Alba Vidal Garcia, it's another student who, whose PhD thesis was this model, model in the spectra of stars, neutral, and ionized gas in a star forming galaxy. So she took our models plus Julia's model and used this code uh, that models the interstellar medium, which is from Hubeni, which is the same guy in the, in the Tibasti models. It's closing the circle. And she came out with this kind of models, in which we have our stellar population, the cloudy output, plus the interstellar medium, which is absorbing the light. And you put these three things together, and you will get this kind of model. And we hope this is useful. She may say, Alba has a lot lo 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 of predictions for the, the flux in different spectral indices, different regions, uh, different things. The blue is the emission, red is the absorption from the medium, et cetera. So you can look at her paper, which is a still in astro-PH, but it's just, uh, it was accepted recently. So, and you can for sure ask her for whatever situation she didn't consider. But this is the kind of thing we can do now taking population synthesis like a step forward, including environment synthesis. Mm -hmm. 
Then I promise I will mention about the, the binary star evolution in population synthesis model. And as you know, since I was a student, almost since I was a child, I can say, <laughs> people have been finding or worrying what produces the ultraviolet excess <coughs> in elliptical galaxies. What's this ultraviolet excess? Mm -hmm. Elliptical galaxies, not all of them, a few of them are brighter in the ultraviolet than you expect from what they have been saying. If you put together all the stellar population and take into account all these things, etc., etc., this this galaxy is managed to be brighter than you expect. So there have been many uh, many arguments that go around cyclically. So people say star formation, or it's binaries, etc., and it's causing fashion from from time to time. The fashion star formation, then it's uh, binary, then it's a strange star, etc. So we decided to. Uh, with Hernandez, is, she's another student in Venezuela, that to, to see to what extent the binary star, interacting binary, can really produce this kind of uh, excess in the galaxy. Here, this is a, some a spectra from, uh, this is a galaxy that we have the this is called UV weak, so you see little flux in the ultraviolet. These are the galaxy band, the UV and the UV, that's 1600 and 2000 astronauts. And this is what they call UV strong. Right? And this is a galaxy that may have some residual star formation. So what you see, there is some excess of emission here, which is not identical to the residual star formation, unless it is uh, ongoing to just at the present moment. So the idea is, how can we understand this? So this, there is this, this kind of plot is very useful. This was developed by the Galax people. So what we, we have here is the UV color in the Galax band, and a near UV minus R color in the horizontal axis. And we have this cross here. So the UV, the UV weak galaxies are in black. They are in this region. And the residual star forming galaxies are this blue thing. And the UV strong are these uh, red points down here. So you say it's a minority. But it's important to try to understand how these galaxies manage to look like elliptical galaxies from all points of view. You look at them and there is no difference at all. But when you look at the spectra, they have some emission here that is hard to see. Then, this cluster, which is NGC 6791, is, is a cluster. I don't, I don't know if there is a, a observed integrated spectrum of this cluster. But if you compute a synthetic spectrum based from this color <coughs> magnitude diagram, you get a UV excess uh, spectrum. Just because of this star, this star here. These are members. These are very hot stars, and this is what people call extreme horizontal range. So when you do a model with the binary stars, interacting binaries, under certain conditions, you can get this extreme horizontal branch. They are extreme in the sense that they are very hot. They are hotter than what we call blue horizontal range. So this, assuming that these stars really exist as, as seen in this cluster. There are no many clusters with this property. So it's, the statistics is very poor. So you can compute models that at all the edges really come to this triangle here where UV excess is. Now, then you enter into a complicated thing because we don't know exactly the fraction of binary star, how many of them are interacting. I mean, it's, a, it's a whole new zoological thing of assumptions that you have to make. Uh, Charlie Ladd has some tables, of, um, or he made some calculations, and he has some binary fractions, and this is what more or less what the, we use. But you see here, we, you can bring this line going all the way here, just increasing the number of binaries, interacting binaries, and all ages you get there. You can also play with other things, like 
Here is with metallicity, but this is like a star forming. <coughs> you, if you start forming, uh, you can have this magenta line here, which is a second burst of star formation in an older population, you will go, go also here. So I mean, there are many options, but at least one possibility is that these stars really exist in, and they, they don't have to be many. They are so, they are so far from the <coughs> main sequence that just a few of them make it blue. So that's a good thing. Another thing that we realized when we were doing these uh, binary things is that the, uh, the statistic fluctuations are also important, especially in clusters, when you want to do this, this kind of uh, calculations. And people have been observing individual clusters in distant galaxies with a space telescope, and they try to determine the age from colors. This, this is not even the spectrum. They just take a few months. But then they, they are talking now about the 1,000 solar mass clusters, etc. They were trying to use our models that are for infinite mass galaxies. When, when we compute these models, we assume that the IMF is populated from all masses with equal probability. This really corresponds to an infinite mass. <laughs> and you cannot expect that the spectra that you compute for an infinite mass galaxy will explain the properties of a 100 solar mass cluster or a 1,000 solar mass cluster. Mm -hmm. So we generalize these things to consider the possibility of having a, a stochastical example <coughs> in which mass conditions and see what happens. So this is a, just an example, which is the effect is bigger than I had expected. This is a very... Uh, young population, one million years solar metallicity for clusters of these masses, uh, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and one million, and the infinite, which is somewhere in, in here. So what is important that you see is that the range of parameters becomes much, the range of flux, <coughs> is a spectra. the red is for the lowest mass, and you can get almost anything. Why? Because then you have a very poor example. All the stars in a, one, in a 100 uh, solar mass cluster, all the stars could be one. If your IMF go from zero to one, you get one star of 100, you don't get anything else. <coughs> or with 10, 20 stars, you will complete this. So the spectra is anything. As you go to more stars, the IMF gets better constrained, and the fraction of stars are more what you expect from the IMF, and you see that the range gets narrower and narrower. But people who are studying low mass clusters in this range have to really worry about this stochastic effect if they want to determine stellar agents from drop down photometry. Because what, what you will predict is very different. And so the, I know some people who have been using this, and they're quite happy with, the, with this kind of uh, uh, solution to the problem because they couldn't fit any model. So that is all, all the models are wrong or or something is wrong with the instrument and, and the problem is that they were trying to explain something with the wrong models. Even we, we have to with the new tracks we could compute models up from ten to the uh, yeah what, uh, one hundred of a million years or ten to the four years old because these cluster are are very, very young, so they need a younger cluster of very low mass. So that's also available now. So during these stochastic fluctuations, we, are, we realize as well that from time to time, you get an excess of planetary nebula, for instance, because a particular mass in the IMF was more populated than normal, and you get this kind of ultraviolet excess in a normal population that you wouldn't have just because of the fluctuation. This is a case of the 5,000, it doesn't happen in a, in a massive galaxy. But it may happen, I mean, the, the, not the whole galaxy has to go stochastically, but if you have a, a specific star formation event in a, in a elliptical galaxy, which may dominate the UV like this, it, it's interesting to take this into account. These are one giga year spectra, for a 5,000 solar mass population, and it's color coded according to the UV axis. So as you see, there is no UV axis at any of these positive red things, but there are a few blue ones which have a high UV axis. 
only for stochastic fluctuations. So that's something important. Now, there is no, no rule in the universe saying that the IMA has to be either analytical or Saint Peter or Chabrier or who, whoever these guys we know, and much less that it has to be sampled as in an infinite mass. <coughs> Here is the same kind of thing, it's uh, UV versus uh, UV minus R. In this side, we have the predictions for models that include a stochastic fluctuation plus binaries for 1,000, uh, 10,000, and 100,000 solar masses. And here is only the stochastic fluctuation. So we see that the binaries also matter, right? It's not just the stochastic fluctuation. But for very low masses, there is a big difference between the two. Even though when we get to high masses, it's much less uh, difference. We go to other bands like U minus G versus G minus R, the difference decreases. So the UV is sort of crucial to this because that's where there are no normal stars in all populations and they may appear either because of stochastic fluctuations or because of interacting bands. So any of the two will be <coughs> very important. Again, and this is a plot that some of my collaborators made, which in principle is very clear to the younger people and explain and shows all the all the difference at once. So what we have we have here color and the standard model is the little black point in the middle of these bottles that they call violins, they call bottles. And what we have here, the one on the right and the left is the stochastic model, and the right is the stochastic mass plus the binary model. And the, the idea of this is to show how, uh, for different masses, this is 10 to 3, uh, 5, same age, and here is also same age, and this is younger age, older age. So you see the effects quickly of how one effect is more important than the other. This is, we don't have to understand this now. But what I want to transmit to you, inform you, is that all of this is available. And you are welcome to use this and ask for whatever you need from us. And have this tool to understand the, the stellar populations that we see with the things. And there are many more applications that I didn't have time to cover. I will say that. The prospects are very good, both in ultraviolet and in the near infrared. In the, the visible is sort of okay, and that's where we have been working for many years. But now that the telescope will start throwing away like crazy this new stuff, people have already a pre-written. So these things are, are working well. There has been considerable progress in evolutionary tracks and spectral library, and there will be more. And one good thing about the, this kind of tools, which I didn't say, but it's true, is that when we get mismatch between the observations and the models, this can tell us where are the problems. Right? People like Paula can come on. This is because the, the stellar atmosphere that you are using are not in the <coughs> So it's very good to have this tool. It's a by model, or there is feedback, continuous feedback from the people. The observation have allowed to calibrate and understand better the stellar population synthesis model. And people have been learning statistics now. We, we discovered that this thing existed. Everybody <laughs> was <laughs> And the, you can see the look for variation. There are many, many papers for doing this. They, the good thing about these techniques, besides being very sophisticated, is that you get an error map. This, this branch of astronomy was characterized for many years that we didn't have a possibility to compute error maps. People will say, oh, you, you are saying that the, this galaxy is 12 giga years or 12.5 12 giga year old. What's the error map? Or maybe we were embarrassed to say it was a plus or minus five. But now people doing all these sophisticated things, they get distribution, they get uh, some kind of Signals and they tell you, okay, this is a very, very good estimation. Also, yeah, for the age of the universe, is it? 
I would be embarrassed to say how well they know the age of the universe. And we don't know the, the age of any galaxy. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of contradictory. <laughs> the, the models are turning out to be useful to estimate the stellar physics parameters <coughs> for the UV emission of distant galaxies. There are already people using this. And with cloudy, we can explore the limitations of this thing. I don't know very well what it is. It's a, a method to estimate the stellar abundance in galaxies. They have some problem with the with this method, and apparently with this kind of model, they can start understanding. Also, the stochastic fluctuation and Banner evolution play important role in the photometric properties of low mass sterile populations that has to be taken into account. So everything, all this effect has to go into population synthesis models, and we should not extrapolate the behavior of infinite mass models to low mass <laughs> sterile populations. That we'll be studying more and more because the telescope gets more powerful. People are looking at the galaxies with a magnifier. Thank you. Thank you. Comments, questions? stars and uh, how their spectra can change in age uh, and uh, the effects of that those, cha the, uh, those changes in the overall spectra of the galaxy. Uh, now thinking about the galaxies in different regions, <coughs> do you think there's an optimal relationship where those both highest stars can be most important? On the world project, you said? Yes. Uh, you have to go, you have to be able to observe them to either from a space in a local galaxy or a, in a, from the ground in a very distant one. But you have to observe the unit. And the emission lines, you, you need an excellent instrument. Uh, this combination of cloudy plus SPS is very uh, powerful. Yes. But I understand that uh, uh, you use the diagnostic diagrams to, to figure out what the output is. To what age can you use this technique? But for, for very old stars, very old uh, systems, this doesn't work, right? No, it's only when they are star forming. So you need a, as long as there is a, a star uh, formation, you, we give you the properties. And you should, what we give is the intensity in different lines. So you can do your own diagnostic diagrams. But it has to be during the time that the stars are forming, which is what uh, Julia did is to assume a constant star formation rate to, to a smooth all this uh, evolution, compute the number of stellar photons. So as long as you are not so far away from the last event of star formation, this should work. Some works in the literature, they they say something about the radio variations of IMF in elliptical galaxies. I'm thinking if this is the classic fluctuations in IMF, it can also explain this effect. Well, I, I want to think that like, stochastic effects couldn't explain that because you know, this seems to be a very massive effect. But some people don't believe these results. Other people, these are another religious thing. <laughs> Variable IMF or, or other people don't. Uh, my feeling is that still preliminary yeah. results, but there is some evidence. I mean, it's noisy, but the equivalent width of this line seems to be higher in some galaxies than in the other. And this kind of model for massive galaxies, <coughs> if you change the slope of the IMF, you can explain that. And if it's a nice study condition, as well, it's not sufficient. It's not the only way you can prove it. Um, when you were talking about the stochastic uh, uh, effects, uh, there's something that I, I, you might have said, so I wanted to confirm or not. So this will affect uh, uh, low mass systems. 
But if we have a late burst of star formation on a massive galaxy, maybe we can see that. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Ah, I see. Because as long as it, I mean, I think a star formation is always in low mass systems. So a big galaxy is just a, the reunion of many of these low mass systems. But if you have a single Orion thing, it's a low mass system. And the, there will be fluctuations. So even if your whole galaxy follows the Salpeter IMF, in your most recent event that you are studying in a starburst, most likely you have some fluctuation with respect to the over, overall IMF. So this is something that has to be taken into account. And to cook galaxies, more or less like Eduardo Vica did in his thesis, like a, a sum of clusters. Right? So you can have a, a whole family of clusters with many fluctuations, and eventually you will get an error bar for your galaxy, not just an infinite mass prediction. Any other comment, question? So let's take our speaker again. Thank you.